thank you, Emma, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm glad to see that state of origin doesn't reign supreme, that some people are, have torn themselves from the television sets and are here to, to enjoy something, something a bit more intellectual. Um, what I'd like to do this evening, really, is just to talk to you extempore, fresh, about, about this extraordinary place called New Guinea. Um, it's a place that lives in our imagination as much as it lives in the reality of our visits. Many, of, many Australians uh, have little experience of New Guinea these days, particularly younger people, I find. And yet it is extraordinarily important to us Australians. Uh, I'd like to start with just a sense of how it relates to Australia. At the time that people left Africa 60,000 years ago and travelled through the Middle East, down into Australasia, Australia and New Guinea were joined. Torres Strait's only 30 metres deep. At times of lower sea levels than this, you can walk from what is now Indonesia through to Tasmania. So when people arrived, this was one landmass. It was settled as one landmass. The people diversified within that one landmass. And until 10,000 years ago, it remained one landmass. So for 35,000 years of its 45,000 year existence, Australia and New Guinea were one. There was no differentiation. They were the one people. 10,000 years ago, sea levels rose. But Torres Strait was created. But that, I would argue, wasn't the end of contact. Contact continued across Torres Strait right through to the present, and I'll come to that in a moment. But I just want to reflect on that 35,000 years of shared history between the people of New Guinea and our own Aboriginal people. Having worked in Central Australia and in the mountains of New Guinea, I see extraordinary similarities in the way people dance, in the way they make art, in their belief systems, in the way they do initiations, in the way they relate with nature. We are all one. The big, dis the big difference is, really, that Australia is flat, dry, and largely inhospitable. New Guinea is it's, it's, it's our evil identical twin. You know, where we're flat, it's very high. Where we're dry, it's extremely wet. You know, and where we're relatively infertile, it has some of the most fertile valleys on the planet with the highest population densities found anywhere on planet Earth outside our major cities, which are, which are obviously a recent phenomenon. So for me, as a young man, New Guinea was this place where I could not only cross the frontier, because in the 1970s and 80s you could cross the frontier, into uncontrolled territory, unknown territory. But you could also see what Australia might have been if the chance conditions of geography and climate had been different. And that surely is the greatest gift any of us can ever hope for, to be able to see us as we might have been had circumstances been different. To me, at least, that is one of the most important things you can do, and that's why I went to New Guinea. I'd like to just go back to Torres Strait briefly because I was there just two weeks ago and saw the nature of contact. 10,000 years ago, Torres Strait was created. New Guinea started its own separate evolutionary trajectory. Its cultures began to differentiate. About 4,000 years ago, people arrived in great canoes from or ultimately from Taiwan, from certainly Southern Asia, and settled some parts of the island of New Guinea. They settled the areas that were seasonally dry, so around what is currently Jayapura in West Papua, these new people, these uh, Lapita people, settled there. Around Port Moresby, which is seasonally dry, they settled there. They had much more difficulty settling where the conditions were perpetually wet. In such places, the Aborigines held on, the people who were the traditional settlers of that land for some 45,000 years. The importance of those new settlers is twofold. They brought new ideas with them. 
They brought new uh, material culture with them. And among the material culture they brought were seagoing canoes. So 4,000 years or so ago, all of a sudden you start getting people crossing Torres Strait again. If you look at Torres Strait and the islands, the Western Islands, the people speak an Aboriginal dialect. Central Islands, they speak a mixed dialect, Aboriginal and Papuan. The Eastern Islands, it's all Papuan. So a new corridor opened up. The people of Tudu Island in the middle of Torres Strait, in historic times, they'd go as far as Lizard Island, just off Cairns, to trade, forage and whatever, and back up to Tudu and then up to New Guinea. So these connections remained live. So much for a sort of a, a geography, I guess, and a perspective on, on the people and their culture. I do think it's important, though, that we keep it in mind because it seems to me we value the art of Melanesia differently from the way we value the art of Aboriginal Australia. For me, it's a great continuity. It, it's part of the same culture. It's part of the same cultural universe, in a sense. And I do think that we need to pay every bit as much respect to the creators of this ingenious art of Melanesia as we do to the creators of the wonderful works of art that have come out of Aboriginal Australia. Of course, New Guinea is an extraordinarily diverse place. I've worked from one end of the island to the other and I can tell you it's bloody big. It's, it's um, over a thousand miles long. It's, uh, a couple of hundred miles for the old, those who uh, like the old numbers better, the old metrics better, um, wide. Uh, and it contains 800 language groups. Sure, there are some similarities that run through some of those language groups, but there's also great diversity. For me, working, for example, in eastern New Guinea compared with the far west, was I, I felt that the cultures and my experience was as different as it would be working in Great Britain or China. Certainly the languages were that different. Cultures very, very different. In parts of New Guinea there are what are called matrilineal or matrilocal cultures. In other parts there are patrilineal cultures. They're fundamentally different in terms of their structure. The languages are different. The way that uh, they relate to the land is different. And of course, there are greatly varying population densities across New Guinea. You know, in the highland valleys of New Guinea, and I understand Bob Connolly spoke to you last week for those who were here. Um, what an honour that was. I'd love, I would have loved to have been in the audience, to be honest with you. But, but Bob, I'm sure, talked about those densely populated mountain valley, valleys where people are quite separated from nature. You know, nature for them might be on the surrounding mountain peaks and maybe very alien, maybe a place that a young hunter might go, but most people may not. So for them, their relationship with nature is very different. It's rather like our relationship with nature. We may go to a national park every few years, but it's separated from where we live. But there are people in New Guinea who live in the forest, who live in nature. And for them, the relationship is very different. For them, the call of every bird at night, the sight of any mammal is a constant recognition, a constant reinforcement that they are part of a living universe of things of which they are only a part. They're not separated from nature, they are part of nature. And that's reflected in their art and in their culture. I've been fortunate enough, I guess, as a mammalogist, someone studying the mammals of New Guinea, to work with people who are more closely associated with nature than those who live in those densely populated highland valleys. It's a really interesting experience to, to go to New Guinea and to go into a village for the first time not knowing anyone. So the experience is a bit like this, for me at least. Um, you'd fly into the nearest airstrip, you'd unload all of your cargo, because for me I needed everything from liquid nitrogen fridges to rat traps to do my studies, so had a few hundred kilograms of cargo. You'd employ local carriers to start carrying it into the area you wanted to get to, and you'd start off. And maybe halfway to that area, your carriers would put down the cargo and just say, we're not going any further. And I'd say, why? So we don't own that country over there, you're gonna to have to recruit someone else. 
So I'd have to select someone to go and see if they could recruit anyone to come and carry the cargo on, which, which would happen. And then eventually you get to a village. And um, in that village, a village in New Guinea is like a, well, it's like a city really because there is every sort of human being in that village. Often the first person who'd come up and greet you wasn't necessarily the person you want to meet first. A bit like someone in the street in Sydney, yeah, whoever comes up to you, man, I want to meet that person first. And it was particularly true for me because I was interested in the mammals that live on the high mountain forest. So the people I want to meet are more like the, the sort of eccentrics who um, might know every plant in the Royal National Park. I mean, if you go down to the Shire and try to meet that person, it's not that easy, yeah? It's not easy in a, val in a New Guinean village either. Often that person's off in the bush by themselves. You know, they don't like the pigs and they don't like the kids and they don't like all the politics of the village. They prefer to be up in the bush hunting possums. But I was lucky enough occasionally to meet that person. And uh, I remember in the middle of the island of New Guinea at a place called Telefoman, where I did quite a lot of my work, I was fortunate enough to overlap with the very, very senior men who knew the mammals, who lived that life, and, uh, and would share it with me. I, I, it was, I remember at one time I landed, as I said, telephone, and carried the gear in, got to a village. People said, oh, Amunsep, he's up in the bush. And I said, well, could you help me carry my cargo up into the bush to meet him? So some people did. I arrived at this campfire in the afternoon, there was no one there, everyone left, so I'm sitting around the campfire at night, you know, wondering what's going to happen. In the wee hours of the morning, this man turns up with his dogs, you know, wearing an old beret and a penis gourd and not much else, you know, and, uh, and I, I said, you know, are you Amonsep? Yeah, didn't speak any English though, you know, so I had a word list from Telephone, and so I went through it with him, I said, Bogol. It's the harpy eagle, the great eagle that's powerful enough to kill young children in that area, can carry them off, can kill tree kangaroos. As soon as I said Bogol, Amonsep's face just changed. The eyes became eagle eyes, looking around, mimicking, mimicking the eagle, walking through the forest, following a tree kangaroo trail. Amazing to watch. Dabol, the tree kangaroo, he changed again, sat up. He just, he knew the whole thing. He knew the intimate lives of all of these animals. Without a single word in common except those names, we could communicate in a real way. Um, and later that day, we, we finally went to sleep and later Amonsep went out to hunt again and I saw the ritual he used with his dogs. Um, he had a small string bag full of um, what was called... Um, I think it was called Nuk Mumul. It was uh, the stones and special objects you would use to help your dogs find tree kangaroos and possums and things. So out of this bag, he took a red stone, murmured certain words, took smoke from the fire, blew it into the dog's eyes, rubbed the dog's head with a stone, put it back, took out something else. And the dog's squirming away because it doesn't like smoke in its face, you know finally let the dog go and then got the next one, did the same thing. Off he went. He came back um, the following day very disappointed, not a single tree kangaroo. He wanted to catch a tree kangaroo to show me one, but uh, his billum was covered in the tails of tree kangaroos. You know, it was really, really something. And I guess I learned a little bit about humility through that experience too, because I, I went back to Amunsep's house he had a house in the bush and a house in the main village of Telephilippe. Went back to his house in Telephilippe and uh, learnt afterwards that that house was extraordinarily special. It was of great significance because the Telephile believe the world is divided into two halves. In one half, on one side, are those are women, uh, those people who understand pigs, understand the fertility of gardens, understand all of that side of life. On the other side are those who understand warfare and hunting and the raising of young men. And Amonsep was the last of the people on the arrow side. There was a taro side for the food, and taro. There was an arrow side. He was the last of the arrow men. And um, I went into his house and there was a rack of jawbones of animals above the door, maybe four or 500 jawbones. 
And as a young biologist, all I could see was, wow, what a fantastic opportunity to learn about the biodiversity of this area. So I said to Amunsep through an intermediary, would you sell me these jawbones? And he said yes, and I gave him, I think, 60 kina, which you know, far too little for that. He packed them all up, I took them in a drum, took them back to the museum, not a mile from here, and sat there for a few years studying them, and it gnawed away at me what I'd done. And um, so finally I, I thought, I'm, I'm going back to Telephoman. I, I've, I've studied these jaws, I've documented them. I'm going to take them back because culture's important. It's not just biology. Um, I packed all the jawbones into a couple of plastic drums, shipped them all the way back to Telephoman, walked down to Amonsep's house, which was in a state of decay by this stage, met an old woman there who said, Telef Amonsep's up the bush hunting. We don't know where he is or when he'll be back. So I just said, could you give him his jawbones back? I, never, I don't know whether he put them back up on that rack, whether the arrow side of Telephone life continued or, or whether it had come to a full stop by that point. I do know that a few years later, the cult house at Telephoman fell down for a final time and was never, never repaired. It, it just, um, it was lost. I guess um, when you see all of this wonderful art that you're about to see or perhaps have already seen in the exhibition, it's worthwhile thinking about the antiquity of that art the way it's traded, the way it's valued, uh, what we make of it here. Of course, that art now has made a great journey, hasn't it? It's left its context. It's come to our house tambouran here, this great house tambouran of art that we call the, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and it's found a new life and a new meaning. The meaning of that art has utterly changed from perhaps what it once was. It will have a new meaning for us. I don't think that should dismay us because um, it's part of a universal constant. You know, I've been to parts of New Guinea where people have shown me a very special object and I've recognised it as something traded from a distant community that was common in a distant community but for them as special by virtue of the fact it's been traded in and it's the only object of its kind in that community. I think that trade and exchange have been central to the development of this genius that we call Melanesian art. It's incredibly varied across the island, but you see designs again and again that are repeated, shared, because they've struck a, they've struck a note with people. They're, they're, something about that work has become hugely attractive. And some, it may be something as humble as, you know, an arrow stuck in someone's backside that they've pulled out and said, oh, I like that design, you know. It might be that. Maybe it's something more formal by way of trade. It's easy to believe, I think, when we look at this artwork, that New Guinean art doesn't have a great and dignified past in the way that European art does. I think that's entirely wrong. The fact is that Melanesian art is by and large made of material that is easily degraded in a tropical environment. So wood, wood rots, yeah? string figures don't last very long. Canoes are made and sink. And arrows, of course, are shot into the forest and lost. So we have inherited the last veneer of a very deep, deep culture of art and other material. We do know, however, that there are a few great survivors. Recently, a study was done using carbon-14 dating of uh, masks and other material culture from the Sepik region. The oldest of those masks and cult figures turned out to be over 1,000 years old. No cult house lasts more than 30 or 40 years in New Guinea. The termites get in, the thing has to be rebuilt. So for me to think of that magnificent cult figure or mask, which is now likely in this art gallery or perhaps in New York, who knows where it is, having been carried again and again from one cult house to the other as it was rebuilt and reinstalled, has a grandeur about it that is no less than 
the Elgin marbles in the British Museum, which have been carried and reinstalled, and the other great artworks of our culture. These, the greatest of the Melanesian artworks, in my view, are the peer of any produced anywhere on the planet. I'd like to just encourage you to look at that art with an eye to reverence to its exceptional beauty, to the incredible culture that gave rise to it, and to celebrate it. And I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you.